BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you, Mr. Morris, and glad to have you with us on Crosstalk today. I was looking at an item on Fox News. We've been following it, of course, among the many things that are on the news today. But uh, this one couldn't escape me. Marines fight to protect the crosses at Camp Pendleton as atheist group seeks removal. And, of course, we have people around the country that are free thinkers and uh, atheists and uh, say this foolishness about God is something we we just don't have the ability to tolerate it. And so militantly, they go after this and... Uh, Here in Wisconsin, of course, we have the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which uh, certainly is expressed, even by the name of their organization, their intent. It was many years ago, back in the 80s, I had the privilege of doing a television show with a gentleman who had come from being an atheist and had been transformed by the power of God. This man, in his childhood, had been used to take prayer and Bible reading out of the schools. His name was Bill Murray, and his mom was Madeline Murray O'Hare. And Bill's our guest today. And, Bill, what a privilege it is to have you back here on VCY. Great to be back on with you, Vic. Bill, uh, this thing, of course, Camp Pendleton and people that are still trying to deny deny God, uh, you know, I remember the old God is dead signs, and I, I was frustrated because they said, God is dead. And I just talked to him that morning, so I know he was alive. But uh, this issue, uh, back in 1963, I believe it was, that uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare won the landmark lawsuit filed on behalf of uh, you, effectively banning prayer in the public schools. Yes, that that's right. And uh, how that uh, how that came about is is not uh, a, a, a short story, Vic, um, because uh, we can't start there, and and everybody is tempted to, but we can't. Mm. Um, the reality is is that the the, the march toward that uh, began uh, before 1960 in an extremely uh, dysfunctional violent home. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, I never, I met my father one time, oh. I think when I was about six or eight years old. Uh, my little brother never met his father. Uh, there was violence in our home, alcohol in our home, dishes flying through the air. Um, my mother could not hold down a job. She was just incapable of it because of her volatile personality. Um, we lived uh, with, um, uh, with her mother and, and, and father. Uh, we had the proverbial nutty uncle that lived there. Uh, this was uh, my mother was a single mother when when things like that didn't happen, and uh, I w- grew up in a dysfunctional family when there weren't very many dysfunctional families. I mean, dysfunctional families are in fashion right now, but uh, they weren't in the 1950s and in 1960s. And I bring this up. Because everybody has this view that uh, Bible reading and prayer was kicked out of the schools uh, by some intellectual who was championing separation of church and state. This is not the case. Uh, the reality is, is that because my mother couldn't hold down a job, uh, that she was recruited out of the unemployment lines by the communists. And, and by the way, this is another um, strange thing, particularly among evangelical Christians, that they believe that communists are intellectuals. The reality is is that the overwhelming majority of communists are, are recruited out of unemployment lines, not out of Ivy League universities. Um, and uh, uh, my mother became a Marxist. Uh, uh, we had marxist the study classes in our home. I met Gus Hall, many of the other communist uh, uh, leaders. My, my mother was uh, uh, just, uh, you know, was awed by Fidel Castro. Uh, and she wanted to move to the Soviet Union because she saw it as a worker's paradise, a utopia. Um, and uh, in 1960, uh, our family, myself and my, my mother and myself and my little half-brother, eight years my younger, 
attempted. My mother dragged us, put us on a ship, took us to Europe, and she actually tried to defect to the Soviet Union because she believed all of the propaganda and lies about the Soviet Union, that she was going to be guaranteed a job for life, that uh, they were going to give her a place to live for a, a small amount of money, uh, that, that uh, there was no profit in f- made from anybody from food, so that the, the food was cheaper and it was plentiful, and everybody got 30-day vacations and six <laughs> And and um, uh, uh, free medical care and free education. She believed all this garbage. Um, well, they didn't want her. They didn't want her any more than they wanted Lee Harvey Oswald, who was already there. And they sent her back to the United States. It was that attempted defection to the Soviet Union, that idea in her mind that that she could somehow uh, go to this utopian society that led directly to prayer and Bible reading being moved from the schools. This was not some intellectual endeavor or great lifting of the Constitution or Jeffersonian ideas of separation of church and state. The reality is, is that my mother had to take me up to the school in September after I had missed three weeks in this attempted defection thing. And uh, in, in walking down the hallway for the first time being in a school with me since so she dropped me off for kindergarten, she saw the Pledge of Allegiance and the prayer and the Bible reading going on inside of the classrooms, and she was livid, not because of separation of church and state, but because her sons were going to be taught to respect God and respect the government of the United States and its constitutional and Republican foundations uh, when she hated the country, hated God, and didn't want to be here. The, the the purpose of removing prayer in public and it was vindictive in nature because she couldn't defect to the Soviet Union, couldn't go live in this utopian paradise that she envisioned that the Soviet Union was. Um, and uh, so the, the people's view of this, of, 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 of what happened, and, and this is why I'm frequently asked to begin in 1963 with the Supreme Court um, uh, decision, what really happened. Uh, and, and why it happened in 63 um, comes earlier than that. And one has to understand that to really understand why we don't have prayer and Bible reading in the schools today. Well, Bill, uh, of course, uh, that that seed fell on fertile soil because there were others who were equally hateful toward God. And Absolutely. Well, there was um, there was a uh, another lawsuit that was headed uh, toward the Supreme Court out of New York, and in that case, uh, there was a, a situation in which there was actually a, a, a prayer that had been written by the legislature that everybody was required to say. And it, it's unfortunate that that they did that. If they would have had a voluntary prayer like we did in Baltimore. Uh, at the time, the Supreme Court might not have sided with them, but because it was mandatory and because it was state-authored, the Supreme Court overwhelmingly found it unconstitutional in 1962. And what that did was set a foundation Mm -hmm. uh, for that 1963 case so that when it got there, the precedent was already there. And all prayer and uh, all, uh, you know, uh, 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 led prayer and all um, uh, Bible reading, of course, somebody can still pray individually in the school, but you, you can't have sanctioned prayer, sanctioned Bible reading in the school, even if it's voluntary, uh, because of that, that 1963 case. Well, Bill, as we, as we go back into the history that uh, was your life, uh, okay, the, the prayer and Bible reading was taken out of the public schools. Life still wasn't easy for you, was it? Well, no, it wasn't. And, and you know, we need to look at um, uh, uh, the, the change, though. There, there's something else that happened there that, um, that just didn't, didn't involve me. When, in back, going back to 1960, when my mother... Um, uh, uh, had this hatred of, of, of we're going to remove this. She didn't file a lawsuit immediately. What she did is she wrote a letter to the editor of the Baltimore Sun newspaper. Uh-huh. And uh, they took that letter, and instead of publishing it as a letter, she was, she basically said, I'm so mad about, I, I don't want the Pledge of Allegiance, and I don't want the prayer, and I don't want the Bible reading in the schools, and I've taken my son out of the school, and I'm going to hold him out and protest and, until they stop, as if that mattered to anybody. And uh, the Baltimore Sun newspaper, which is extremely liberal, 
they didn't print that as a letter to the editor. They came out, they interviewed my mother, they took our pictures, and they put the story on the front page of the newspaper. Oh, it went out nationally. And what began to happen is everybody in the country that hated God, that hated Jesus Christ, that hated the nation, started to send her money. Here's a woman that, that, that couldn't afford a Nash Rambler, a used Nash Rambler, and suddenly she had enough money to buy a large American car cash, um, uh, you know, to, to buy an office building, to buy clothes for the first time. This is somebody, you know, our, the sheriff would be coming to our house every six months trying to repossess something. And uh, now... You know, uh, my mother had all the, the, the money that, uh, that that she needed because of of, of the, the number of people in our nation that hated the nation and favored the dictatorship uh, that in, in the Soviet Union, that, that, the, the mass-murdering dictatorship. There were that many people she that also, hated this country. She used to also go out and do uh, editorials or, or preach sermons against God. Uh, well, oh. yeah, of course she did, and but she raised a lot of money direct mail. Most of the money mm. that, uh, that that she made, uh, which eventually we can talk about that later, led to her demise. But uh, um, most of the money that she made uh, um, was in in sending out uh, monthly newsletters. And and to be very honest, uh, you know, she would instigate. Uh, violent situations, uh, hoping to get uh, um, uh, to be able to report on me being in fights with other teenagers, so that she could uh, uh, get more money out of people. Um, and um, uh, it uh, uh, once she realized uh, she she wasn't she wasn't all that smart. I mean, she 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 went to law school, but then failed the bar exam. So she was smart, but not brilliant. Uh, failed the bar exam three times. Uh, but she was still had gone to law school and was still smart enough that she understood how to make money out of this, and uh, uh, and 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 she did, and she made a a, a, a lot of money out of it. Well, now uh, we're coming up on a break here, but uh, as as this all happened, uh, how did I mean you were taken out of school? What happened to you? What what did she well, do? Well, I wound you? up back in the school. I mean, I, that, that, uh, it was only a matter of, you know, three three weeks. I missed a month of school. I had to make it uh, uh, back up. So uh, I spent uh, that year in um, Woodburn Junior High School, which has since had its name changed to some politically correct Native <laughs> American name, and uh, Chinko Pin, I think. And then uh, I went to uh, Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, which was an engineering prep school. Um, so I, I was in the school, and uh, I mean, there it, it was uh, um, the part uh, in the junior high school in the in the the local junior high school that was pretty bad because we lived in an immigrant neighborhood, and the majority of people that lived in that neighborhood had escaped from countries um, that. Uh, um, were now inside the Soviet bloc. Uh, many of them had crawled out under barbed wire to get away from from Poland and Hungary and East Germany and Russia. And now they had a family in their midst that wanted to make America like the country that they had escaped from. Uh, so the, the neighborhood was fairly rough for me, and, and so was that school. Right after the break, we're going to come back and follow Bill's life as, and also that of his mother, Madeline Murray O'Hare, as uh, the, the, her profile nationally became so evident, everyone was aware of Madeline Murray O'Hare, a woman without God, a woman who hated God. We'll be back in just a minute with Bill Murray. to Genesis with scientist Dr. John Morris. Dr. Morris, what did the Neanderthal people look like? Chris, the Neanderthal people were people just like us. They were probably an ethnic language group that migrated away from Babel into the harsh regions of Europe. Appearance-wise, they would have probably looked much like us. Typically, they would have had a more protruding chin, a more sloping forehead, and a more pronounced brow ridge on average, but each of these features are found in some people alive today. I suspect that if you put a Neanderthal in modern clothes and he walked down the street, you wouldn't even notice him. He might be ugly, but he'd certainly be human. I'm sure that Neanderthals were people, descendants of Noah, just like you and me, and they needed a Savior. At least that's how I see it from a Back to Genesis perspective. Thanks, Dr. Morris. 
For more information on the foundational principles set forth in Genesis, simply visit us on the web at www.icr.org. That's www.icr.org. This is Chris O'Brien. God bless. Our guest is William J. Murray, Bill Murray, the son of Madeline Murray O'Hare, a man who began his life without God, but through the miracle of transformation by the power of God, he became a believer. And uh, we're talking about some of those previous years, uh, the years that were formative, the years that uh, record much of the bitterness and hatred that Madeline Murray had uh, for God and for her country. Uh, Bill, you uh, went through grade school uh, into college. What happened? Well, I, you know, I went uh, um, uh, going just just a little bit back. Let's talk about this uh, the, the the high school, if if I could, because I think sure. that's integral. And you know, I do again, you know, Vic, I I, I do have a there's a tremendous amount of detail in uh, in my book, My Life Without God, that Worm mm. Daily has has re released that, that we just absolutely don't. It's a three hundred page book. We just don't have time to get into it. But but going back to to the high school. Uh, you know, I, I get asked a lot, well, did you know what was going on? And, and I find the question curious. You didn't ask it, uh, because, uh, you're, 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 you're about, you're, you're about the same age I am, or a little older. You're right. But the, the younger, uh, uh the people that, that interview me, when I get on a show with somebody that's 25 or 30, and they're the host, they ask me, well, did you know what was going on? And it took me a while to figure that out. Here's the reality. Fifty years ago, people, kids were teenagers were involved with their families. If their kids were 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 if 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 it was a Republican family, they were Republicans and they knew what 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 it was what politics were about. If they were Democrats, they're Democrats. They understood what it was about. If they were Catholics, they were actively involved in the church. If they were Baptists, they were actively involved in the church. They were Baptists. Today. Uh, you know, teenagers don't even know what their mother and father do. That's They've right. got earbuds on. They're looking at at, at, at computer screens. Uh, you know, they're 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 involved in porn or watching something on the other side of the country and uh, living in a virtual uh, world. They're living in a virtual world, and yeah. and we have a situation now where, particularly with young men, that they don't they don't get out of their adolescence until they're thirty, and and so you have a tremendous number. Of seventeen, eighteen, nineteen-year-old uh, adults who are totally ignorant of anything that's going on around them, mm-hmm. except what's going on with their friends and Facebook. And if you ask them what their father does for a living, they don't even know. And if they know where he works, they don't know what he does. If they have a father in in, in the home, and that wasn't true fifty years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, I was a dedicated uh, uh, Marxist. I believed all this stuff. I was taught all this stuff. And in high school, I was the I was the president of the United Nations Club, which is where all the Marxists went in the public school uh, clubs. They all were part of. Uh, of of uh, of of the United Nations club so uh you know it it is it is a it, it, people have to particularly the younger people listening to this show uh have to understand this was a different era when when teenagers were actually a part of their family mm-hmm. well folks i would urge you to get a copy of this book which uh, we are making available through VCY bookstore or vcy.com uh, it's called My Life Without God. It is a power-packed book. It gives the testimony of where Bill came from, where Madeline Murray O'Hare uh, came from, and what happened in their lives. And as Bill has well said today, the details are too numerous to even begin to unfold the pages that are there. We will be touching the high spots, but I would urge you to get a copy Newly released uh, through uh, WND Publications, it's called My Life Without God, William J. Murray. And uh, this uh, is the WND Books Classics, the 30th Anniversary Edition. And I would urge you to get a copy and uh, share it, read it. And hopefully it would help you to understand the importance of a foundation in a godly family, something with the basis God's Word and not a hatred toward God or a, a God that's carnal, a God that's materialistic. So if you would like to call 800-729, uh, let, me, let me correct that. If you'd like to call directly to VCY Bookstore, 
They have a number where you can order this book. It's 888-722-4829. That's 888-722-4829. Or you can go to vcy.com and get a copy of this. It's a terrific book. It is something that uh, literally has a ministry to your heart as you realize the battle that Satan is waging for the lives of people. Bill, as uh, we look at what has happened, uh, and as we see uh, over these years, how how was it that all of a sudden you began to even consider that uh, Christianity would be something to, for you? I didn't. Um, you know, what what really happened to me, there was, a, there was an economic change. When I left my home uh, as a teenager, um, I uh, discovered that um, if you held down a job or worked in a single industry uh, and did worked hard and did good work, that you got promotions and increases in pay. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd never learned that inside of my home. And I did very well. I wound up in the airline industry. I was an agent and an assistant manager, then a manager of ramp services and a director of operations. And I was I was very successful and earned a lot of money very early. I was, uh, uh, for one company, the youngest uh, uh, member of, of management ever in an airline. And uh, uh, I made a lot of money. And, and I resented how much the government took. And the Marxism uh, that I had learned and the collectivism, the utopianism, that just sort of washed away. And, uh, uh, you know, I... I uh, but the atheism didn't go, and I moved to the other side of, of the atheist spectrum. I became an Ayn Randian, a, a, a fan of John Stossel before John Stossel was ever a libertarian, uh, you know, a, a, a Ron Paul supporter before Ron Paul ever ran for office. Mm. I mean, I became a, social, a libertarian, a social Darwinist. And uh, uh, the only thing that I saw that was important was me, and uh, uh, since I had uh, an ability to do very, very well for myself, I believe that, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the most important things to me were, uh, other than myself, were the, were the best food, the best restaurants, the best booze, and the best sex. And that was it. That was all that was important. And there's only one minor problem with this when you attempt to live a life like this. And it, and by the way, it very much disturbs me and distresses me as I go to things like the, uh, um, uh, you know, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. every year, and to see it flooded with thousands and thousands and thousands of of young college conservatives. And the, the, the current uh, a batch of, of college conservatives today are, are all libertarians, and they, they want low taxes and no limits on their social lives. Um, you know, they, they, want the, they want the same free sex the liberals have, the same dope and the same alcohol, uh, except they don't want to pay any taxes. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I see this as um, um, very dangerous for the entire conservative movement. The number of votes that uh, Ron Paul got in the presidential primary of people that think that there should be no limits on social activity, that legalizing drugs, legalizing prostitution um, would, would be just fine. That alarms me greatly that in some elections uh, this man on that kind of a platform got 25 and 30 percent of the vote. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it because I, and I say the reason it alarms me is because I know what it do, did in my life. Uh, that life of of thinking, okay, poor people, uh, you know, if they can't work, they just need to starve to death. Um, uh, that uh, living that lifestyle nearly destroyed me. Um, you know, when when you smoke dope when you want, and drink when you want, and eat when you want, and jump on airplanes and go when you want, and you can live that kind of lifestyle, it can burn you out really fast. And it burned me out and brought me down real fast. It brought me to my knees until I needed help. And the available help was uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hand of the Lord, that reached down to pick me up out of my muck. While this is going on, Mom was still carrying on. Oh yeah, she was. She was. Uh, uh, she wound up in uh, Texas. Wound up in Austin, Texas. Uh, I think ran for city council or mayor one time. Uh, didn't work out for her, but she made a lot of money. Owned a big house up in the hill. Owned an office building. Uh, 
and um, uh, made a lot of money. Uh, she particularly uh, was very, very good at uh, getting uh, elderly atheists, uh, particularly out of that those Depression era atheists, uh, uh, whose children and who had uh, become Christians or found refound Judaism or something like that, uh, that that she would be able to talk them out of out of uh, all their money. Um, and uh, because you know you don't want to leave it to your Christian or Jewish uh, unbelieving kid, and and uh, she's she's very very good at that. Made made a lot of money. Her organization itself was um, never very much. Um, uh, you know, she claimed hundreds of thousands of followers, but uh, uh, you know, I know for a fact that the, the biggest mailing she ever did from down there was about of newsletters was like thirty five hundred. Uh, you know, and, and people say, oh, well, how could she make all that money with, uh, you know, only having a few thousand people on her mailing list? Well, brother, uh, I'll tell you what, you show me a 3,000-member church, and I'll show you one powerful, rich church. Mm. Well, you know, Bill, when you were with us years ago, I'll never forget, even as you prayed, that uh, if God would, he would touch your mother's heart, and if she would come to him. She never did that, did she? Not that... Um not that I know of. Uh, she had a, um, uh, unfortunately, she had the uh, uh, very bad, uh, I'm not going to, I don't know whether to call it a habit or what, but uh, she would hire uh, uh, convicted felons, convicted murderers to work for her. Um, I think that uh, she enjoyed the sense of power of having somebody work for her that had taken another human life. I don't know that for a fact, but I, I, I have a good feeling that it was. And one of those individuals that um, uh, she hired that was a convicted murderer, she put on as an office manager. And uh, he stole a great deal of money from her, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, uh, of uh, uh, bonds that can be uh, uh, sold uh, on, on the open market. Um, and uh, she uh, fired him, tried to get him into jail and uh, again, and um, the way our justice system. So she wrote some... Uh, uh, very malicious things about him, about his manhood, and so forth and so on, which was the way she operated. And um, I'll make a long story, a short tour, uh, he gathered together some felons that he had served time in jail with and kidnapped her and my brother and my older daughter, who was an atheist uh, from the time that I was an atheist and, and uh, uh, worked with uh, my mother, kidnapped the three of them. Uh, held them until they got hundreds of thousands of dollars in ransom, and then murdered them. Mm. And, uh, folks, uh, the way of the transgressor is hard, but God's love reaches down to one who even denied his existence. You want to want to look in the Bible? The Apostle Paul was one of those haters of Jesus. Oh, he had a God, but the God was not not the one that he was serving, and that his God's son was not not recognized to be his son. And uh, then it was that God struck him down, and he found the true message of God. Well, today we're going to be taking a break in just a moment. When we come back, Bill, I'd like to talk about some of the things. You're in Washington now. You have a special ministry, and uh, I'd like you to share with the people even about these crosses there at Camp Pendleton and, and uh, what God is using you to do there in uh, the seat of our government in Washington. From the frontiers of scientific discovery, researchers are now taking design elements from the natural world and creating extraordinary breakthroughs that benefit our health, our quality of life, our ability to communicate, and even help us work more efficiently. Many of these are documented in the book, Discovery of Design. In this book, you'll learn how things like batteries, human organ repair, micro lenses, and even credit card security all have links to natural designs. You'll learn how innovations like solar panels in space use technology from beech tree leaves, how the study of the leg bone led to the building of the Eiffel Tower, how the study of the timber beetle helped to improve the use of chainsaws, 
Over 75 such illustrations are given. It's a fantastic journey into the intersection of science and God's blueprints for life. Discovery of Design is available for a donation of $16 or more to VCY America by calling 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829. And welcome back to Crosstalk. Our guest today, William J. Murray, a man who has written the book, My Life Without God. And there, folks, there are people listening even to this broadcast right now that may be living a life of prosperity or things that you have made gods in your life, but you have never come to know the, the love and forgiveness and the cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ. And may I say today, listen, as Bill shares his heart with us, because it was out of darkness to light. It was out of bondage to true freedom. And the book, My Life Without God, is available. If you'd like to get a copy of it again, you can uh, contact our, our offices here at 888-722-4829, 888-722-4829, or you can go to vcy.com. The name of the book is My Life Without God by William J. Murray. Bill, uh, as we see how God has changed the direction of your life from darkness to light, and he's laid a passion on your heart to, to reach out to make a difference in our world, you're there in Washington and seeing all this going on, and uh, what are you doing there? Well, I am. my office is on Pennsylvania Avenue, six blocks from the Capitol building. It used to be two blocks away, but my building got torn down for mm-hmm. <clears throat> needed to have a more modern building there. What can I say? But uh, I, uh, I'm on Capitol Hill every day that uh, Congress is in session. Um, I work with uh, a lot of the issues that you talk about. You, you mentioned, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Pendleton Cross at the beginning yes. of this. Yes, uh, It's an interesting history. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but of the seven men that climbed up that mountain and put that cross up, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as a memorial to their fallen comrades, Marines, uh, that three of them subsequently died in, yes. in, in service in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, this um, um, uh, one of the chief defenders of that is a good friend of mine. His name is um, uh, Congressman Randy Forbes. And Congressman Forbes is absolutely leading the battle on Capitol Hill. Uh, I, I just, in fact, he did the Huckabee show just the other day on on this issue, the Chuck Huckabee radio show, and he has, um, uh, he of course is one of the founders of the Prayer Caucus. Before Randy Forbes, there was no Prayer Caucus in Congress. I mean, official caucus. It has over a hundred uh, members, uh, and a lot of people out there they think all congressmen are bad. Let me tell you that that ain't right. Uh, the Prayer Caucus is uh, 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 over 100 congressmen that meet and pray every single week. Uh, the Congress is in session and in work for the things that you and I believe in. And people ought to check that. They they can uh, they can uh, go to his website. They can look at. They can just look up Google Prayer Caucus, or they can go to uh, Forbes.house.gov uh, forward slash uh, Prayer Caucus. And uh, read about uh, you know what uh, the prayer caucus is doing to defend this, and that isn't all. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, this same um, uh, atheist organization that's called the Association, the Military Association of Atheists and Free and Free Thinkers, MAF, they have also just uh, caused the Air Force to uh, remove one of its standards of making sure that the rooms are ready on Air Force bases for temporary uh, bivouac, uh, have Bibles in the rooms, that that be removed. And he is fighting that. He is also the one uh, in the prayer caucus that fought uh, uh, when uh, the Veterans Administration Hospital said that people couldn't bring Bibles to the hospital anymore. Uh, so we do have, I mean, there there is a body in Congress of good uh, and uh, good men and women, godly men and women in the prayer caucus that are that are fighting every day for the things we believe. Everybody up here 
is is not somebody that is is uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, having a having a girl in their lap and smoking a cigar and drinking a drink. Far from it. There are a lot of great men up here. A lot of deacons. There, uh, Congressman Aiken, who's running, Todd Aiken, who's running for the. Uh, a uh, Senate in Missouri, and who is a congressman there, his degree is in theology, not not in politics. And we have a, a, a you know, so it's uh, 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 we we need these kind of people supported rather than than uh, what we've got out there, which is virtually all conservatives hating all congressmen. Uh, we 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 should be honoring the ones that are really fighting for us. Bill, uh, obviously, you must have a website that people could track and follow. Sure, uh, we have we have a couple. It's uh, religiousfreedomcoalition dot org, just religiousfreedomcoalition dot org. But the reality is, is that any search engine, any search engine, if you just type in religious freedom coalition, uh, we're going to come up number one. And then I do a, a tremendous amount of work in the Middle East and on Sharia law. And we also have a website at Sharia Free USA. Well, Bill, that, that's uh, another item, because right here in our own city of Milwaukee, uh, our suburb, uh, Brookfield, Wisconsin, there is a big push to bring in a mosque. And, of course, uh, the argument is, well, it's just another religion. It's freedom of, of religion, and uh, they pray in a different way, and they have a different God, perhaps. You know, and we, we understand uh, Islam. We know that uh, their God has no son. Uh, but the issue, when it comes to the Constitution and them having the right to worship as they please, but the issue of Sharia is what really throws a monkey wrench in that, because a lot of people don't understand what Sharia is all about. Yes, and, and unfortunately, the liberals in our country who always side with mass murderers, whether they be Joseph Stalin or Mao or Castro or, or, or the mullahs of Iran, um, you know, think that Islam and its misogynistic uh, ways are just wonderful, which is just mind-boggling. But if if you could give me two minutes uh, here to to explain uh, something, because I actually have this is one of the areas that I actually happen to be an expert in. Mm. Um, the floor is know, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, in the West, uh, we have various forms of government. We have the government within the home, the family government. Um, then we have the uh, the church government. Uh, we have the, uh, the, 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 the the local uh, government. Uh, we have the national government, and then we have God's government, the, 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 the overall, the, the, that which, which God, uh, in, in, in the, the morals that, in, 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 uh, in for, that he dictates uh, uh, upon us and his, his government in heaven. Five different forms of government. And uh, uh, the family uh, takes care of the government within their own home, and the local community takes care of those, and the church takes care of its law within, within its own church and governs itself. You don't have any of that in Islam. There's only one law, and that's Sharia. And Sharia governs every single aspect of the life of every individual inside the home, inside the mosque, inside the local government, inside the national government. Every Islamic uh, government in the world, their constitution says that no law can be passed that is contrary to Sharia law. And uh, in and, and every aspect of life is controlled. Uh, what shoe you put on first in the morning is controlled. You can only eat food with one hand. You have to eat food with, with only your right hand. You can't eat food with your left hand. Uh, you can only wipe yourself when you go to the bathroom with your, your left hand. You can never, you can never touch your private areas with, with, with your, your right hand. And, and I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Every single aspect of life at every level is controlled with Sharia law. And we have liberals say, oh, Sharia law doesn't matter because, you know, that's only inside the mosque. But that's not true. One of the main aspects of Sharia is that you can never criticize Allah, that you can never criticize Muhammad, that you can never criticize Islam. When was the last time you saw a TV or movie show or anything else that criticized yeah, that? That's right. We, we have Sharia law in the United States right now um, because there, there are all sorts of things that people are either afraid to do, or even the government will come in and tell you don't do these because they're they're offensive to, to Muslims. Now, it isn't as bad as it is, let's say, in the United Kingdom, 
where a man was just put in jail for one year because he was, quote, a racist, because he put a sign in his apartment window that said, no Sharia law in the United Kingdom. And because of that sign, he was put into jail for, for, for a year. Mm. You've got, got public pools in <laughs> London, England, where it says Muslims only. And, and uh, no one else can come in except a, a Muslim, because Muslims don't want to swim in water that is contaminated by, by, by an infidel. infidel. This is Sharia law. We just saw what happened in France. The anti-Semitism, the misogyny that, that, that is in, incorporated into this, Sharia law is everything. And um, uh, I just was writing for my update today that will be at my, up, up, my, my site at the end of the day, that the Muslim Jurist Association here in the United States ruled that Muslims shouldn't work in law enforcement because uh, uh, we have secular laws in this country that are contrary to Allah. And this is, this is the Muslim judicial bodies telling Muslims that they shouldn't work for the police or the FBI or, or any organization because they should not participate in anything that imposes secular law because the secular law could be contrary to Allah's law. Um, so um, uh, th- this, is, uh, uh, th- this is something that is, is a, a threat to the, the very existence of our Constitution and our constitutional law, and something which has already basically made governments in, in Europe uh, um, surrender to Sharia. And Sharia does come outside of the mosque, folks. You've heard just what Bill said. Uh, it is something that governs lives. What about the issue of, of even the prosecution of people caught in, in uh, what uh, Sharia calls a sinful lifestyle? If it's a woman that's caught in adultery, what happens? Well, what? you know, in, 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 in many of the, the, the solidly Muslim countries, they're, they're killed. But let, let me, you know, that, is, that doesn't happen here yet officially, although we have honor killings in the United oh, States. Yeah. And we have a lot more honor killings than are reported, because a lot of them uh, are, are reported as, as, as accidents. When, it, when a 19-year-old Muslim girl is found with a broken neck at her home, they say, well, she fell down these three stairs. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but, uh, uh, we don't have that. But, but, but here, here's an example. This is an example. Kuwait, which was freed uh, from Iraq by uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, and uh, which our our troops went over there and fought and died to free Iraq. Last week, they voted to make blasphemy a crime punishable by death. So that if you insult Allah, insult the Prophet, or you say something contrary to the Koran, in in and, and saying anything contrary to the Koran. And by the way, I, I don't think people understood. This isn't cursing Allah. Let me let me give you an idea. A woman is facing the death penalty in Pakistan because she drank water from the same well as a Muslim woman. And drinking an infidel, drinking water from the same well as a Muslim woman is considered blasphemy. So she is, she is, is, is waiting trial for a death sentence in Pakistan for blasphemy because that is, uh, 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 you know, con- considered uh, a uh, 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 blasphemy. Uh, and as far as enforcement of Sharia, uh, our troops in Afghanistan have been told that uh, the, the Marines were told that when they're they're out in encampments, they cannot urinate in in uh, the, the the direction of Mecca because it's disrespectful to Islam. That it's part of Sharia law. Unbelievable. When they sleep at night, their boots, their feet, boots cannot be poor, poor, be pointed toward Mecca. That's Sharia law. And then we have these idiots saying we don't have Sharia law. Well, what is that? Bill, we're going to be right back in 60 seconds. Bill Murray, our guest today. This is Crosstalk. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. Continuing our commentaries on 20 characteristics of false teachers embraced by the false church. Number four is false teachers willingly embrace unbiblical philosophies. Second Timothy 4.4 4 says, And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That word fables is translated also philosophies. Isn't that interesting? Because Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit 
according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So false teachers turn their ear away from truth and follow unbiblical philosophies. The very same unbiblical philosophies were warned about in Colossians 2.8 not to be cheated by. So false teachers knowingly embrace false teaching and unbiblical philosophies. Our website, worldviewweekend.com. Okay, we're back with you with the final segment of Crosstalk today. Our privilege to have William J. Murray with us. Uh, he was the son of Madeline Murray O'Hare. God wonderfully reached down and through the miracle of salvation brought this young man who was once an, a- once an atheist to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we praise God for that. Well, Bill, we've got about eight minutes left here. I know you've got a website again. Promote that. And if people want a copy of that book, My Life Without God, if you'd contact our the number at our source here at 888-722-4829, that's 888-722-4829, or you can go to vcy.com and uh, contact us there. At, uh, the book is a special at 25% off. This is a special uh, offered by our bookstore, so please get in touch with us. Bill, I'm going to give you the rest of the time. Continue to share, please. Oh, yes. Well, anybody that wants further information, we've got uh, a lot of resources. Uh, they can go to religiousfreedomcoalition.org or just look up Religious Freedom Coalition. Uh, we have a lot more on Sharia at our Sharia site at shariafreeusa.org. Um, .org. Uh, and then we have a, a good uh, uh, Facebook presence. In fact, we've got a lot of discussion going on right now about this thing with uh, Muslims serving in law enforcement at our Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com um, slash uh, uh, Sharia Free uh, uh, USA. I mean, we we are facing, um, you know, we, we have a lot of people that... that um, I think that, that say that uh, we we have a government that is that is anti-religious and 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 I kind of uh, say well that isn't really true. Uh, we have an administration now. We have a government structure uh, that is becoming much like it is in the United Kingdom, like it is in France, in which it is um, anti-Judeo-Christian, uh, not anti-religion. They don't appear to have any problems with uh, with Islam. In fact. Uh, uh, we have a we have a government uh, uh, now that has uh, helped to overthrow the the, the uh, secular government of, of Libya, the secular secular government of Egypt, the sec- secular government of Tunisia, and now is trying to overthrow the secular government of um, of uh, uh, Syria. And uh, these quote rebels in Syria, uh, they're they're Al Qaeda. Uh, and uh, we have these strange bedfellows of Senator John McCain. And uh, and President Barack Obama, uh, who want to overthrow the secular government of Syria, where most of the Christians in the Middle East now live, and uh, we want to uh, uh, help uh, the Al Qaeda rebels who will kill all those Christians and drive all those Christians off. We want to put them in power, and uh, I don't understand it. You know, this guy Assad is not a very nice fella. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they have a, under him, there's a pluralistic society. You have brand new churches being uh, built. Christians uh, do well from themselves. And we want to do the same thing we did in Iraq, the same thing we're doing in Egypt. Go in there, allow a Sharia compliant uh, government to, to uh, 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 come in that uh, persecutes and, and kills Christians. I don't get it. As we see Israel and uh, Iran. And the possible powder keg that could, could could go off almost any time, Bill. Well, I, uh, if I were Israel, I wouldn't count on any support. You know, um, uh, one of the things that that the Obama administration did by overthrowing the secular government in uh, in Egypt is uh, the secular government of Egypt was uh, they weren't an ally, an ally of uh, of Israel, but they were at peace with Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we have there now is uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, who now controls the the the, the parliament. Uh, they have issued a declaration that uh, Israel is the main enemy of of Egypt, and so 
thanks to our intervention and getting the secular government of Mubarak out of there, uh, we have now created a, a, a major enemy on the, on the border of, of, of Israel to Israel. Um, all those aircraft that we have sold, all the mili- sophisticated military hardware that we gave Egypt is probably at some point now going to be used against Israel. And it will be a much more even match than it was when uh, uh, Egypt, uh, the last time Israel fought Egypt, and Egypt was using outdated Soviet equipment. And um, um, uh, we have created a situation in, in there, uh, it, rather than stabilizing the region in which President Obama claimed, we have actually made the reason much more volatile and war much more likely. And I don't think the war is going to come first with Iran. I think the war is going to come with Egypt. Bill, final thoughts. Will you look at America? And uh, do you have any predictions, any feelings of where America is really headed? Well, this this is a decisive year. I think this is really a decisive year. Uh, I think if we have another four years of having an administration that is... Uh, um, opposed to uh, Judeo-Christianity, that wants uh, to simultaneously uh, have the contradictory, uh, 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 the contradiction of both uh, uh, Sharia law and same-sex marriage. I'm not quite sure how that works, but um, and the concept that all religions are merely traditions and and not in fact faith. Uh, that if we have four more years of that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what direction America will go. Uh, God isn't in the business of saving nations. He's in the business of saving people. Mm. And if anybody is praying for America to be saved, I, 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 would, I would beg them to pray for the salvation of the people rather than the nation. Bill, in closing, what can people pray for you? Because you're in a key spot there in Washington. Well, please pray that the, the doors stay open to me. Uh, you know, I, I, I when when uh, in the previous administration, I was able to uh, call an assistant to the president of the White House and say, "Please help me save this man's life who has been arrested uh, in Afghanistan or, or or Iraq and and who's going to be put to death because he's a, a Christian and he's being accused of this and that." And I could get help. And I, I don't have that anymore. And um, uh, I need the doors that, that are open to stay open to me and, 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 and for other doors to open up to help save the lives of, of, of Christians, particularly in the Middle East. Bill, it's a privilege to have had you on the air today. And again, I hope many people get your book. And we will be praying for you and uh, that God would speak to the hearts of people who have been so married to secularism and materialism and, and God is afar off, but that he is concerned enough to take someone who even blasphemed his name to be a child of God. We thank God for what he's done for you. Thanks, Bill. Uh Thank you, and God bless you, Vic. And thanks for joining us, ladies and gentlemen, on Crosstalk. Have a great day, and we'll see you, Bill. All right. God bless. Listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from crosstalkamerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. <laughs>